I would like to extend uh, to you a greeting from a transplanted Floridian in the land of the long white cloud here in New Zealand. And I'd like to talk to you about the importance of performing a needs assessment analysis prior to implementing water and sanitation projects. Now, in two of the past presentations that we've had, we've had individuals talk about the needs to address arsenic. One was on rainwater harvesting. Obviously, each one focused on a need or reaction to realities in various geographical locations. Now, I am an architect by training. I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not a civil engineer. But I have been working on water projects for over 12 years. And as I get into my work and reflect on what I've done and, and how things evolve, I've become more and more convinced that in order to have a successful project, an individual or a club really needs to go and study the realities of a location prior to assigning any sort of solution to that area. If you've been involved with water and sanitation projects for any length of time, you are probably familiar with the scene. It is the exhibit floor of what could be a house of friendship for Rotary, or maybe even the water form itself. And as you walk the aisles, what you're seeing is a myriad of technology. It could be a water, various types of water filtration projects. It could be rainwater harvesting. It could be pumps. Or even maybe some sort of a sanitation solution. And as you talk to the various vendors, each one seems adamant that the technology that they represent is the silver bullet. It is the cure-all, no matter where you go, no matter what the problem is. And you really cannot fault them, because the genesis of their solution came from a strong desire to solve a problem. And now, they've taken that to a business. The problem they've got, or the problem they've got with you is, that they want you to buy their solution, and it just might not fit your problem. So the question is, is what is your problem? Well, I can tell you right now that no matter what technology you use, your biggest problem is going to be how to make that solution sustainable. And once you talk about sustainability, you enter the world of wicked problems. Now the Harvard Business Review has a definition for wicked problems, and you can see that on the bottom of the slide. They say, a wicked problem has innumerable causes tough to describe and doesn't have a right answer. Not only do conventional processes fail to tackle the problem, but they may exacerbate situations by generating undesirable consequences. Every wicked problem is essentially unique. Every wicked problem can be considered to be a symptom of another problem. The existence of discrepancies representing a wicked problem can be explained in numerous ways. The choice of the explanation determines the nature of the problem's resolution. If you begin to think about what is being implied by the definition of the wicked problem, it might begin to become clear to you that the wicked problems are not the realm of just one technology, nor is it the realm of one dis professional discipline. Rather, it needs to be attacked in all different silence. And that is part of the premise of this discussion. One of the issues that makes this such a wicked problem is in the baggage we as volunteers carry to the products we work on. Now, that baggage is not necessarily the baggage that carries our clothes or the materials we ship. Actually, uh, that baggage is our preconceptions based off our own realities from back home, and whether or not those realities match up with the realities of the location we are work in. Uh, in order to be sustainable, water products must address unique locational realities. We need to prioritize actual needs. Now, sometimes those needs can be seen on site by us. But sometimes, sometimes, those needs are really as the user sees them.
let me show you how we see that. That's very important for us to understand what the users see as an actual need. Uh, there are certain technological realities, economic realities, logistical re realities, social and cultural implications, which impact not only the user's perception of the product itself, but how to manage the project, which gets down to management. Education, how do we actually change the paradigm and make sure that the users understand the problem as well as how to, to fix the solution. And also one I think is really, really incredibly important when it gets down to sustainability, and that is ownership of the project itself. Who owns this project? Is it a rotary project? Or really is it the user's project? So let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. Here are two technologies. Both, if you look at them from the vendor floor, have reasonable solutions. To your left is a water filtration system that's in the Dominican Republic. To the right is what we've seen before, but it's a pump in Guyana. Both seem to be perfectly acceptable solutions. Well, to the left, the pump, the problem it has is that in the Dominican Republic, electricity is fairly transient. Sometimes you have brownouts. As a matter of fact, a lot of times you have brownouts. And there's no electricity, there's no water. At the same time, it's a fairly complex system. So if any part breaks in that system, it's down. So it doesn't work very well. As you see, it's shuttered. Right now, it's not working. And even though the, um, the club paid a fair amount of money for this project, it's not solving the problem because it's just not working. But to the right, in Guyana, seriously? There's a pump, and it's working. It's fairly simple, not an issue at all, right? Well, it is. Quite frankly, it's not being used because it's not addressing a cultural issue in, for the Amerindians in Guyana. You see, the Amerindians live on the river, and the river has what they call black water or sweet water. They love that water. It's sweet. It tastes very good. But they also know that during a rainy season, when the water flows from the hills down past the latrines into the water, they get sick. So they do understand they need water. Unfortunately, when the pump was built, the water coming from the pump has a taste of iron. They don't like the taste of iron, so they don't use it. So even though the pump works, it's not being used. Again, two solutions. They look great, but they don't work. And by the way, as anybody who has worked in pump products knows, that was not a very cheap solution. So a lot of money was spent, and unfortunately, it was not spent correctly. So water and sanitation projects should be process driven and not product driven. In the selection of the technology used, you need to deal with the realities of the location you're dealing in. And those realities could be economic, they could be logistics, and they can even be cultural. But the bottom line is, you don't take a solution and shoehorn it into the problem. You don't take a single technology and force feed it into the location you're at. Rather, what you really need to do is, you need to have a toolbox of various technologies. And once you begin to understand the reality of the location you're dealing with, and again, those locations could be economic, could be cultural, to be logistics, to be a myriad of things, but the bottom line is you take those realities and look for the solution to respond to it. So let me give you an example of what I mean when I talk about a toolbox. The slide you're seeing right now is actually the water portal from a website called Actopedia. I found out about Actopedia when I was at Istanbul for the water, World Water Forum many years ago. If you look at it, what you're seeing is there's various ways of approaching water. Source and recharge, water and lifting devices, treatment and testing, storage and distribution, product uses. And as you click into each of these portals, you drill down to various technologies that you can actually look at uh, to address a certain problem. This is an example of what I mean by buying a toolbox. It's also interesting to know that Acropedia has other portals involved too. Sanitation, finance sustainability, and assessment are examples of what are available 
in the Acropedia website. I should also mention to you that um, Acropedia is in the WASRAG uh, website, and I'd like to address Acropedia in a little more detail in a, um, in a lecture I'll be giving later on. Well, now that we know we've got a toolbox, the next question is how do we use it? Well, when it gets down to water, I think the first thing to realize is that water is a quantity and quality issue. And quantity is the first thing you've got to address. In other words, where is the water coming from? And how does the user get access to it? Is, it? is the water coming from rainwater harvesting? Is it coming from a lake? Is it coming from a river? Is there a shallow well? And how do I get it there? Is there a distribution system involved? Those are the things you need to resolve first. Once we resolve the water quantity issue, we can move on to water quality issues. But as an aside, I guess I should mention to you that if you at least get the water down to the user for a good hand washing program, you're on your way to a very good water project. But back to water quality issues. There are two types of water pathogens. One's organic, one's inorganic. On the organic side, you can break it down to four subsets. Starting from small to large, it's viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and helmets. In other words, worms. Each one of those pathogens could require a different type of filtration system or disinfection system. Now on the inorganic side, as you've heard from the previous lecture, you could have arsenic or other chemicals that could be actually human-induced into the water. And again, the same thing applies. Different types of pathogens require different types of filtration or disinfection systems. Let's look at the image to the left. You've got a gentleman and his mule getting water in the river. What are the pathogens? Well, I can tell you from past experience that upstream, there are cattle and there are pig farms. So there's a really good chance you've got fecal contamination in the water. At the same time, I also know they're washing cars and washing laundry in the river too. So they can be introducing some inorganic pathogens. The bottom line is you've got to test the water. Look to the right. That magenta is not photoshopped. That's actually a bacteria in the water. And that water is about 15 feet from the homes in the area. I can also tell you that a week prior to my coming to that village, they had a dengue uh, virus um, breakout. Big problem. And again, the same issue applies. You've got to test the water to see what your pathogen is in order to have a decent water project. So let's assume you've got a project. And in that project, you've done some water testing, and you identified the pathogen. And you even have a toolbox, and you identified a technology to address the pathogen itself. Is that all you really need to know to develop a project? Have you addressed logistical realities? What I refer to as a who, what, where, and how. In other words, who's going to maintain the program for you when you're gone? Who can you partner with? Maybe for assessment. Maybe if you actually have a similar technology that you can use. How are you going to get the technology to the site? How are you going to maintain the program when you're gone? Is it an economic issue? Can they afford to pay for the technology initially? Can they afford to maintain the program? Those are what I mean by logistical realities. Here's an example of the hows. On the left, you've got how people get around in Guyana by boat. On the right, is how you get around the Dominican Republic on a motor taxi. Each means has an impact on technology you use. I would also venture to say that in order to have a sustainable project, one needs to understand the social and cultural realities of the individuals that one is working with. This includes their social hierarchies as well as their cultural, cultural and religious taboos. Let me give you an example. In the Dominican Republic, the villages that we worked with were evangelical Protestants. And we had an understanding that while our volunteers were in the villages, they would not consume alcohol. The reason for this understanding was <clears throat> that there was a very high percentage of orphans and unwed mothers in the villages, which were the result of tourists coming in and getting the girls drunk and impregnating them. As a good friend of mine said, the Western tourists imported two things to my country, discotheques and prostitution. 
Another factor that had a major impact on the success of the project had to do with the tension between the Protestants and the Catholics. So even though the villages we were working in were predominantly Protestant, the Dominican Republic is a Catholic country. And if one wants to do anything of scale in the country, one needs the help of the Catholic Church. Having the Catholic Church as an ally allowed us to get product through customs without paying duties or tariffs. We were also able to store the product in warehouses of a major Catholic business, Rugal, the rum company. You remember what I said about the village's concern about alcohol? Rugal was also in instrumental in acquiring granulated activated carbon at a bulk rate, thus reducing the cost of the filters that we were producing. So it's very important for our success to get the Protestants and the Catholics working together, as well as get the Protestant villagers to understand that we had to work with the rum company. I should also mention the social structure that we had to work with in our village. It was a patriarchal structure, with a pastor presiding over lay ministers. In other words, the men were given the leadership roles. But anyone working in developing countries understands that one needs to get the help of women if one wants to do anything of substance. They are the stakeholders. They are the ones that are truly concerned for the health of their families. So it's imperative to change the old paradigm and bring a new paradigm, allowing women in leadership roles. An example of women in leadership roles was exhibited in a project that I was working in in Guyana. The lady on the left of the slide is the chief of Cabacaburi, an Arawak village. She was given that honor because the men were away from the village working for logging companies and mining ventures while the women ran the village. It was understood at an early stage that any interface with the village had to go through her. So, if one truly wants to gain support of those one works with, one has to understand who is in command and what the rules of engagement are. For instance, in Haiti, that just might mean working with a mystique priestess, in other words, voodoo. I mentioned changing paradigms for water and sanitation projects that just might mean changing the user's perception of reality. When having a conversation about water and health, I was told once that people just die. That's reality. This brings up another important element to a good WASH program, the need to educate. In the Dominican Republic, an individual could not obtain a filter unless he or she attended a meeting where the use and maintenance was explained. A photo of such meeting is illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide. The individual is also given a pamphlet that re reiterated what was taught at the meeting, which was in the image to the right. In addition, the project technician and the woman who represented the village would frequently visit the individual to make sure that they were using and maintaining the culture correctly. Repetition sometimes can be the key to making an idea stick. So here's an example of the management team in the Dominican Republic. On the upper right, you've got Pastor Ken Koo, the patriarch. Below him is the educator, Alerico. To, to Alerico's right is Cesar. And then you've got to the far left, you've got the builder. You've got another technician, which is uh, Willie, as well as a young lady that was working at the university that did the efficacy studies for us. What you're not seeing are the women uh, who are representing each village, as well as the Peace Corps um, volunteer that's overseeing the project while we were away. Traditionally in Rotary, when we talk about partnerships, we begin to think about the relationship between a host club and a sponsor club. But sometimes it takes a village to have a truly successful project. The village might consist of the relationship between the project and businesses, like which you illustrated in the upper left and the, and the lower left slides, or a religious organization that helps you get through charities, like the upper center slide, or it could be the use of academics, such as the lower slide, Dr. Pedro Bernal, who is very instrumental in working with us on efficacy studies, or it could be the upper right when we're working with uh, NGOs and governmental organizations, such as the Center for Disease Control in the Ministry of Health in Guyana, or 
It could be with uh, radio stations or TV stations and getting the word out. Partnerships can be the lifeblood to a project. All that being said, at the end of the day, the most important partner that you will have is the user himself. And to that end, the issue of ownership becomes critical. As much as we would like to claim ownership for our clubs or Rotary in general, if the user does not have a sense of ownership, the life of the project is in serious jeopardy. The fact is, you are a transit to the village, and the villagers are there permanently. Projects, no matter how effective they are, are subject to Newton's law of entropy. In time, things will age, run down, and ultimately break, especially without some sort of maintenance program. And even if there is such a program in place, the user still has to use the technology. Therefore, the user has to have a sense of ownership, and to obtain that, there has to be a sense of empowerment. When they are a part of the decision-making process, workshops are not only a great way of allowing a community to feel empowered, but just might be extremely helpful to the assessment team in determining what the real problem is and what could be an acceptable solution. In the end, if it's your project and it breaks, it's your problem. However, if it's our project and it breaks, it becomes our problem. My anecdote for this point is from a friend of mine who worked with Mercy Ships. He came to me and asked how he could apply for a rotary matching unit that would allow Mercy Ships to fix 14,000 wells in Africa. Obviously, the wells were in perfect working order when they were first installed, so the question became, how and why were they allowed to break? I cannot help but speculate that one possibility is that the user did not feel a sense of ownership in the wells that were drilled for their behalf. My hope is that your takeaway from this brief presentation is that water and sanitation projects can be fairly complex. In other words, they are by definition wicked problems. Wicked problems cannot be solved on vendor floors, nor are they the domain of a single profession. Instead, their solutions require one to get out of the silo and look at problems from a number of perspectives. One way to do that is to first go to the location one is intending to work in, identify the problem, determine various realities that are unique to that particular place, identify stakeholders, determine what roles need to be filled to make the program viable, identify potential resources, and gain acceptance and a sense of ownership from those who are, in the end, use and maintain the program. I am a big fan of grants such as the Rotary Discovery Grant that we used in Guyana. It was used to fund a needs assessment team which came into Guyana, worked with the Ministry of Health and CDC Guyana, determined what the issues and resources were nationwide. The team also connected Rotary hosts and sponsor clubs met with villagers to ascertain social structures and leadership roles, surveyed existing conditions while testing the water at its source, as well as the efficacy of various technologies and approaches. More importantly, the team conducted workshops with villagers who were initially very skeptical because others had come before offering their solutions to the villagers' problems without first understanding the issues the villagers deemed important. Do you remember the well that they refused to drink from? In the end, a rainwater harvesting and collection program was developed. It should be noted that initially the sponsoring club intended to employ a point-of-use water filtration program, which would have been similar to what we use in the, in the Dominican Republic. That solution, though valid for the Dominican Republic, did not submit, fit the unique needs of the villagers in Guyana. I thank you for your time and look forward to a healthy conversation on the website. Hopefully this will spur some more discussion of various ways to approach problems.